Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our session. My name is Sanford Quinter. I'm a design theorist, writer, and educator based in New York City. I'm here today with my good friend and well-known designer, Bruce Mao, to discuss a variety of topics developed in his just published Compendium Manifesto, MC24. My relationship with Mao began many decades ago during the run-up and launch of our publishing enterprise called Zone and Zone Books, among whose ambitions was to explore how philosophy and design, thought and sensory experience could be integrated into a single environment to both extend and test the limits of what a book can do. Mao has gone on to design more than 200 books, not to mention cities, national identities, institutions, and so forth, and to write quite a number of highly influential books of his own as well. As Canadians, we met and shared a lifelong concern inherited from another Canadian, Marshall McLuhan, who saw never an opposition, but always an infinitely flexible metabolism to hold between medium and message. Much of today's discussion, I imagine, much like Mao's new book, will address the ways that design can, or indeed must, be construed as an expansive practice, a methodology and an ethics, a way to understand and a way to act in order to address the urgencies emerging around us today. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to my friend, Bruce Mao. Thank you, Sanford. Uh, delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to just share um, uh, some notes on sort of what we've been working on and, and the approach really that is uh, central to our practice uh, and outlined in MC24. Um, so the book really started uh, uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, and uh, this is, uh, it, it, it went to press before the pandemic. Um, this is the first paragraph of the book. Uh, practically everything we do today needs to change. Uh, we're still doing most things as we have done for, uh, for the longest time, as if we own nature and have unlimited resources. Uh, we don't even think of waste as an idea. We don't think it's an invention. Uh, we treat nature like a pantry and a toilet, paradoxically. Uh, we think short term, party like there's no tomorrow. And we pass, we pass the bill to our children, to the future generations. We dump problems we can't solve into places we can't see. Uh, and many of our solutions create more problems than they correct. And that challenge, that challenge of actually understanding our problems in context, in, in, a, in an ecology, uh, I think is more and more urgent. Um, I want to just touch on the context. Uh, we start with this. Uh, it's, I think, the most important fact of the last century. Uh, we're now 7.9 billion on our way to something like uh, 10 billion by, by mid-century. Um, and we can see where that development is happening. The red line is the more developed world. The blue line is the less developed. Uh, we have a massive uh, challenge in really, uh, you know, meeting this new reality. Um, if you think about you know, the implications of that, um, I like to think it's not, uh, we don't have, have uh, failure problems, we have success problems. Uh, we have problems because we succeed in solving uh, so many of the challenges that uh, we created. The good news is, according to Kurzweil, that we will not uh, face the problems of the future with the tools of the past. Uh, this is his work on uh, our expanding capacity, uh, and he shows that it's it's entirely predictable, uh, and um, and we can see how uh, how exponential that capacity is. Uh, so he says that by 2025, we'll put the power of a human brain in your pocket for the price of an iPhone, and by 2050, uh, that device will have the power of all human brains. 
The bad news is that we have a real crisis uh, in our climate and uh, in our ecology. Uh, and according to the IPCC, uh, we have now about 10 years to really confront it, uh, which is really you know, it's, uh, quite challenging. Uh, and now on top of that, we have uh, the pandemic, uh, and on top of this, uh, a real crisis of governance. And so what that really amounts to is what I call the crisis stack, that we have a kind of layer cake of trouble that uh, where, uh, where these, these kind of global challenges are really you know, smashing on top of one another. We have the pandemic on top of a crisis of racial justice, uh, a climate crisis, a food insecurity crisis, on top of a governance crisis. Um, and I think it's really important to actually understand these problems in context as an ecosystem, not as individual, uh, individual problems. They're really all kind of knitted together uh, into the greatest challenge that we faced uh, in history. What we see that's really uh, interesting to me is that uh, all of them have a common denominator of empathy. In other words, our ability to understand the experience of other life. Um, and that's really what, um, what design is all about, that ultimately design is a, is a methodology that begins with caring, caring about the citizen, their community, and ultimately their ecology. Uh, so we really have a, in design a kind of method that we can apply to confront those challenges. Um, several years ago, we did a project called Massive Change, and the back cover really says it best. It's not about the world of design, it's about the design of the world. We saw uh, our, our capacity to shape the world changing dramatically. And this was the, probably the most important diagram that came out of that process, um, that we saw that, that in fact, business, culture, and even nature itself uh, were becoming uh, design projects, that we were designing the natural world. The project started with an extraordinary quotation about, by Arnold, Arnold Toynbee, a British historian. And he said, in the long sweep of history, uh, the 20th century won't be remembered for violence and conflict or for technology and, and invention. Instead, it will be rem remembered as an era in which we, we imagine the welfare of the whole human race. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's the biggest idea I've ever heard. Uh, what an extraordinary insight. Uh, he said that in 57, I wanted to know, is it true? You know, did we do that? Um, most of my friends said, Bruce, don't touch it. it you know, we, it's a disaster. We didn't do that. Uh, what we saw was that it was not only true, but it was radically true, that we were, we were confronting these challenges uh, and solving problems uh, you know, and really changing the world. Um, after the, the, when the show opened in Vancouver, um, I went to a high school and I, I, I did a presentation. And after the presentation, a young woman came to the microphone and she said, Mr. Mao, I think you're not thinking big enough. And I said, well, you know, that's like at the moment, most people are not accusing me of that, uh, quite the opposite. Um, and she said, you know, Toynbee talked about the 20th century, thinking about the whole human race. Uh, we want to think about instead uh, all of life. That's our project for the 21st century. Um, and she just totally blew me away. It was a, you know, an incredible insight. She was absolutely right. We had a blind spot. Toynbee was really thinking about it, you know, in 57 in the old way. Um, and that really set off our journey to what we call life-centered design. Um, and that's really what we want to talk about today. Um, you know, I'm part of an architecture school in Northern Canada called the McEwen School. And it's a tricultural project. Uh, and that uh, with, with French, English, and indigenous leaders. Uh, and so I've been spending time with, uh, with these folks up in Canada. Um, and what, they, they, what I discovered is that they have a cosmology that puts life, not humans, at the center. And it really fundamentally changes our way of thinking about you know, what, what design can do and how we sort of see our place in the universe. Uh, the question is, are there principles that we can apply? And that's really what, um, what massive change is all about. Um, you know, these are the 24 principles uh, that we developed as a way of kind of thinking this way. And I, I just want to touch on a couple. Um, the first is first inspire, uh, and that is we take responsibility for our ability to optimistically uh, see the future. 
and inspire, uh, inspire others to go there. Um, the second is uh, begin with fact-based optimism. Um, it's not um, blind Pollyanna stupidity optimism. Uh, it's informed by data and really understanding what's actually going on, which we can see in a way that we haven't ever seen before uh, in history. Uh, and you know, this is the work of of um, uh, you know of our world and data. Um, and it shows really the kind of positive inversion that has happened in the most uh, important metrics. Uh, and the last one is we're not separate from or above nature. That ultimately, um, you know, our understanding of our place in the universe uh, has changed. Uh, we, for most of history, thought of ourselves as quite separate. Uh, so that's really what I wanted to introduce in terms of a kind of um, set of concepts and principles. Um, and I'll I'll hand it back to Sanford at this point. Well, that's a uh, wonderfully uh, rich and dense uh, presentation. Uh, I see no reason in uh, order to uh, apply uh, proper emphasis to start with the overarching principle of the book, uh, which you mentioned uh, uh, midway through your presentation. The idea of a, the concept of a life-centered design. Although the principle is well explained in the book, it's one whose meaning is almost certainly to be missed, almost certain to be missed, which as a theorist, I find to be not the worst thing in the world because it compels one to explain the term carefully and continuously. Life here, is not your life or my life, but one that undergirds the collective tissue across which all things interact. A system, the system that begets and subsumes the broader adventure of each and every world, present or possible. It is an affirmation contrary to all the platitudes in which we endlessly bathe that design correctly conceived is not properly for us. Would you agree with that? I would. Uh, I think that um, the idea, I mean, you know, I have to say that, that working in Northern Canada at the McEwen School with the indigenous uh, leaders there, uh, it really blew my mind. It was really uh, kind of, realization that they had a cosmology that, that uh, I had been searching for for 30 years, that really, um, you know, they come to life uh, to honor and respect life with all the living things, you know, with all the living, you know, uh, creatures of the world. Um, and we see ourselves as part of life and connected to that kind of, uh, you know, uh, complex web. That's a very different place than human-centered design, which is really kind of the narcissism of, of human uh, culture that places ourselves at the center of the universe. I mean, we're still trying to realize the Copernican revolution, where we finally discover that the, world, that the universe does not revolve around us, that we are simply another chapter in the story. You know, I had an incredible experience with E.O. Wilson. We, we went into the, into the jungle in Panama. E.O. Wilson's probably the greatest life scientist working today. And Wilson said, uh, you know, there's only one thing on the planet, it's life. And life has an experiment going on in form. And we're one of those forms, that's all. Um, we don't have a kind of special status. We don't have permanence, and we're not here forever. Uh, we're here for our time. Uh, and I think the sooner that we can understand that our practice of you know, creation and uh, the impact that we have in the world has to be conceived with life at the center, not humans, uh, the sooner that we will confront all of those uh, all in all the crisis in the in that crisis stack that I talked about. Does that make sense? 
Um, it certainly does to me. We maybe if we have time, we can get back to the uh, some of the details, uh, especially in the way in which this calls for a transformation, ultimately not only of attitude but of consciousness itself. Uh, but my second question um, uh, is uh, the way you invoke a series of compound crises that characterize both our present historical predicament and also our obligation as designers. It's a list that even our mainstream politicians finally acknowledge and recite verbatim, almost exactly as you did. But designers rarely, if ever, make claim to ambitions at a national or global scale, perhaps out of fear of hubris, or perhaps because they mean something entirely different by the word design than you do. What I find interesting is to take these two words that you like to use, massive and change, and reassess them separately rather than together. Massive suggests something larger than what can typically or routinely be apprehended or contained. An idea or the idea that a more revealing reality exists at a larger scale, larger than our senses habitually grasp. The word change, also taken at the cosmological level, and I'd like to say that it's a very important thing to introduce that scale and scope of understanding and of our predicament, the cosmological, which uh, of course you say in a way you were, was brought, if you like, to the foreground of your attention through your engagement with indigenous um, cultures. The word change taken at that level invokes a reality very different from that which most designers address when they produce contained solutions. They do not see design as a permanent disposition to the act of learning, which I think is one of the strongest features of the program that you outline in your book, as a call to pay permanent and sustained attention, not to what is, but to what is uncertainly and continually unfolding. So I hand this back to you. What I'm asking you in a way to comment on is the idea that uh, design is, uh, needs to address an entirely different order of magnitude um, in terms of its conception of the cosmos. And secondly, that that very cosmos is uh, not one that can be mastered, but one that must be followed uh, in its adventure in time, the concept of change. That's a great, great question, great formulation. Um, I think, you know, when I first started talking about massive change and the kind of, you know, understanding design as economies, you know, the, the kind of realms of your life that are being produced and designed, um, people said, Bruce, you know, you're a, you're a nut, you're, you're a megalomaniac, you just want to control everything because they associate design with control and, and singular authorship. So they want, you know, it really has a kind of uh, fascist undercurrent of singular control. Um, and I said, no, 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 it's not about control, it's about responsibility. That we actually have responsibility for the ecosystems that, that, we, that sustain us. And if we fail to design at that level, we design for failure. We need to think about design in context. We need to develop a methodology of really understanding the complex ecosystems that, that we rely on. Uh, and when we fail to think in that, at that scale, we damage them, we destroy them. If you look around the world over the last hundred years, where we've, where we've failed to design, we've designed for failure. We really you know, put things in crisis because we did not design them. Uh, and if you think about the way that we think about design, we, we try to isolate the problem. We imagine a discrete entity that's the problem. And then we lock a solution onto that problem one-to-one. -one. Um, that way of thinking 
has created all of the damage that that we've done. That way of, of kind of taking the problem out of context and applying what you know accountants have invented, which is externalities. In ecology, there is no externality. There's no outside. Uh, it all counts. It all comes back. Uh, and that way of thinking has to change fundamentally in our methodology. And it really comes from a book, uh, you know, a project that we did together uh, called Incorporations. Wow, that was, yeah, that was an incredibly important uh, formative period uh, for both of us. Um, and uh, just so the audience understands, this had to do with a uh, project that we worked on beginning in the early 90s. Um, which was a total uh, project of design and uh, bringing uh, the emerging forms of thought, which had to do with the shift toward a life uh, science-based um, model of explanation for the universe, uh, complexity theory, dynamical systems theory, and so forth. And what it did for both of us, I suppose, was bring a kind of a, an ecological habit of mind uh, to the foreground. Uh, which I think we both tried to keep as a um, uh, as a, uh, a framework uh, for any form of explanation uh, that we produced. Now, I would like to say, uh, since uh, we're coming into the uh, end of this session, it would be a mistake. I'd feel very remiss if I didn't bring in um, the a particular uh, problem which uh, which you invoked in your presentation. I, I don't mean problem, but I mean concept. Uh, no one who's paying attention can fail to note the centrality of, a, of this term that rides exactly in tandem with life-centered design. Um, then it, it is the term that you use, which is empathy. Empathy is used in your presentation very much in the way, or rather in your work, very much in the way that Greeks use the word participation to describe how two things penetrate one another, how something particular, for example, can exist in relation to something universal. What's beautiful and surprising in your use of empathy is the way it both encompasses, but also moves beyond a mere psychological state. It describes a recognition that states of mind are states of things, of physical things, that our obligation today is to project our attention outside ourselves and into the world, which is where we came from in the first place as an accidental thing among things. I mean, for me, the empathy is uh, is core to the methodology, and really core to um, understanding and unlocking those challenges. I think the idea that we can somehow superimpose our will uh, on those problems and superimpose our will um, on the on the ecologies that uh, that sustain us um, is is really you know, a, a falsehood, uh, and that ultimately what we need to do, and the, and the common denominator in in that you know crisis stack, is the idea of understanding other living things, understanding other living species, other living ways of being, so that we can we can see what we need to do in context and really develop a methodology uh, that isn't about only us. Uh, ultimately, it's about, you know, it, it is the only way to our success. So it's about us in, in that sense. Um, but more importantly, uh, it's about how we all, uh, how we're all in this together. I mean, if you think about you know, the challenge of, race or governance or all of all of the things that we outlined uh, the common den denominator is that we're in this together well i would like to say as we uh, close that uh the great challenge uh that i hear 
uh, in what you're doing right now, of course, is to uh, is to bring design uh, into a completely different uh, uh, sphere uh, of action. Uh, no longer on behalf of our uh, uh, of our of our. Uh, standard and routine uh, central narcissistic beliefs, but to be put at the service of, uh, of the great adventure of which we are really a part and which in a way we don't really apprehend the full meaning and scope. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you everyone else for your, uh, for your, for your attention and your time. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, del really delighted to be here.